allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, it's a lot nicer when it's big. Uh, good morning and welcome to the uh, March 26th uh, County Commission meeting. Uh, I'll remind everybody to silence their cell phones if they have those and meeting documents are next to uh, Commissioner Kelly over here. And if you do need a listening device, uh, you can contact Robert Front Row Blue Shirt. So with that, we'll start with a routine business. Item number one is consider a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Any changes or corrections? If not, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item two is to approve the county commission minutes of March 19th, 2013. Move the minutes. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item three are bills to be paid in the amount of $861,099.48. Pay the bills. Second. With comment. Mr. Chair, uh, the, the bills today include uh, just over 200000 for uh, software in uh, IT and in the jail. Thank you. Commissioner Barth, any other comments? If not, those in favor of approving the bills signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. There are no reports today. <coughs> Item five is to approve the routine personnel action. I'll move routine action. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve routine action. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion unanimously passes. The next item is application for abatement. Kyle Helseth. Good morning, Kyle. Good morning, Commissioners. Kyle Helseth, Equalization Office. We bring before you this morning two requests for abatement. The first one being from a Douglas Beltman, record ID 78010, for 2011 taxes in the amount of $803.04. This is on an owner occupied difference. Make the motion. Second. Any questions for Kyle? I have a question. Mr. Barth, how do we go back uh, to 2011? Those were payable in 2012, right? He had. <coughs> it's a refund. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for Kyle? We have a motion and a second to approve uh, ID 78001. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. We'll go to item B. Item B is for Francisco Madrigal, record ID 53727. This is uh, also an owner-occupied problem that was corrected, and he's asking for an abatement on his 2011-2012 property taxes in the amount of $861.84. Motion to approve. Second. Do we have any questions for Kyle? If not, we have a motion and a second to approve ID 53727. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Good morning, Pam. Good morning. Pam Nelson, the Treasurer's Office. And I have um, five abatements. Uh, they are all for the purposes of the elderly freeze. The people are all well into their 80s. Um, I have ID number 46251. Uh, for the amount of 327.22, I have ID 45042 for the amount of 1176.22. I have ID 40805 for um, $603.86, and I have ID number 33189 for $816.82, and I have ID number 40453 for $35.60. Thank you, Pam. Do we have a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions for Pam? Mr. Chair. Mr. Barth. Uh, it's really not about these particular ones, but Pam, the, the official deadline for filing that stuff is like now, right? It's Friday at 5. So, but we will take postmark stuff. So. And, and oftentimes people forget that they have to do this every year, and so they may not qualify every year as well, but uh, the deadline is this Friday. Is that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
And there was a nice story in the paper about it on Sunday as well. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve items C through G. Those in favor signify by, say, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item 7 are notices and requests. <coughs> a notice from the South Dakota Department in, of Environment and Natural Resources of guidelines and procedures for South Dakota's abandoned underground tank removal program has been received. Thank you. There are no planning and zoning notices, and there are no petition for compromise of lane today. The next item is opportunity for public comment. If anyone has any <coughs> public comments on any item that is not on the agenda, we would take those now. Otherwise, we'll move on to the agenda items. No movement, so we'll move to the next item. Regular business. Item 10 is consider appeal of a decision by the Minnehaha County Human Services to deny rental assistance on case number 50695. Carol Moore. Good morning, morning Carol. Commissioners. Um, you have before you, and Doug Cummings is here today representing the client. Um, they have requested an appeal for this client who has been denied financial services by Minnehaha County Human Services. Minnehaha County Human Service guidelines state that a client can request a review, which was done by Jamie Phelps, our emergency relief supervisor, and if denied, can request an appeal with the Minnehaha County Commission. Carol, can you move the microphone a little closer? A little closer? Is that That's better? That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the client claims she has she now has two children in the home rather than one, so the over income denial is no longer valid. The original application noted one child in the home. However, the caseworker also denied the request for a motel based on other resources and that the county does not supplement these resources. And the client has asked for a couple weeks at a motel. Uh, Doug from East River Legal Services has represented her on the landlord tenant issue as well as the case review. She is struggle she's living with a boyfriend at his relative's home. She advised the caseworker that she was struggling feeding the family and get SNAP, which is food stamps of $69 a month. There are no cooking facilities as a motel, whereas UGM, the Women Children Building, would provide food and staff support as well. And uh, the client was recently paid $1,450 in SSDI, SS benefits, and child support. Client stated that she is moving to Arizona State by her family as soon as Sioux Falls Housing makes the decision on whether or not she gets the low-income housing voucher back. And just as a note for the commissioners, low-income housing vouchers are able to be transferred from one state to another state. She could have used the SSDI SS uh, child support she was recently paid to this month to pay for a motel room this month, but she reportedly has been staying with family and friends. She could also utilize UGM Women and Children's Building for free temporary emergency housing, and they would help with food and have support staff as well. Um, so the denial was based upon other resources. If the client does not continue to stay with family friends, then UGM Women and Children's Shelter is available for temporary emergency housing placement, and this will meet the food needs of, uh, as well. The county guidelines also state that the county does not supplement SSDI or other forms of government assistance where other resources are available. And in the memo that I prepared for you, for the commissioners, I did include those guidelines at the bottom of that. And also the clarification on the federal poverty standards because with three people she would be under income, with two she was over, just so we have clarification on that. Any questions I can answer for you before you have a chance to talk to Doug Cummings? Any questions for Carol on this? Case. Thank you, Carol. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cummings. My client, Tricia Hare, is a uh, single mother. Doug, would you identify yourself? Okay, I'm Doug address. Cummings, uh, lawyer with East River Legal Services. I represented Tricia Hare, uh, who is the appellant. The uh, policy of the commission is not to use names in these cases, so please uh, continue, but. Uh, We'd prefer that you don't do that. Okay, that's Thank fine. Thank you. Um, my client is a single mother of two elementary age school children. She has an autoimmune deficiency which requires her to go to Mayo Clinic for treatment several times a year, and when she goes, she stays for several days. She lives on $878 a month in Social Security Disability and receives about $400 a month in child support. Sometime in late January, early February, she was at Mayo for several days. When she returned home to her subsidized apartment, I think it's a townhome, the pipes had burst and it was flooded. 
so the place was uninhabitable. The landlord refused to pay to put her up in another place. She used what she had left of her own money to put herself and her children in a motel for a week and then came to our office and then came to our office when she was served with eviction papers because she was unable to pay her share of the rent of $100. HUD subsidizes the rest of it through Sioux Falls Housing at Section 8 voucher. <clears throat> we then went to county for some temporary assistance, which was denied, and I later found out it was denied because they made an error thinking she had one child with her when she, in fact, had two children with her. We tried to work things out with the landlord. We came to an agreement on the eviction case and just agreed to mutually terminate the lease with the understanding that she would be able to take her Section 8 voucher with her because it was a, a uh, mutual termination of the lease. To find out later that's, that HUD has now changed its rules and if the tenant owes any money to the landlord for back rent, utilities, etc., the voucher cannot be used until that is paid. So we appealed to Sioux Falls Housing. We had a hearing on that. Um, they've yet to render a decision. We're hoping this week we would get one. Um, so we reapplied for temporary assistance to the county. The county at some point negotiated or attempted to negotiate with the landlord to pay the back rent. But that would not have solved the problem because the place was still uninhabitable because of this flooding. The, the landlord basically decided to go in and gut the place uh, because of the flooding and the other damage and it needed other work anyway. So the place was uninhabitable during all of this period of time. There was no place for her to go. So we had a hearing in front of Sioux Falls Housing, which is similar to what the county does, arguing that, number one, the law in South Dakota allows a tenant to leave and not owe any further rent if a place becomes uninhabitable through no fault of their own, and number two, that the lease had been mutually terminated by agreement, and we're, we're waiting a, a decision on that. In the meantime, we went back to county for temporary assistance. My client was told that she was ineligible, although eligible income-wise, she, she was ineligible because she failed to use private nonprofit resources, which the county feels relieves them of their legal responsibility to pro provide help for the poor. Now remember, we're not asking for anything permanent or anything long-term. We're asking for a decent place for this woman to stay <coughs> pending this decision by Sioux Falls Housing, which we should get shortly and we've been waiting already over a week for it, but I understand some of the, well, the director and deputy director have been out of town and they need to make the final decision on this, so that's the reason it hasn't been made. My main concern about this decision is, number one, I feel my client is exactly the type of person that should be getting help from the county human resources. My second concern about it is the county using private nonprofit agencies who have very limited funds to relieve themselves of their legal responsibility to help the poor. I do not believe it's legally correct for the county to say, you haven't gone to Salvation Army, you haven't gone to out community outreach, you haven't gone to the mission before we will help you. If you go to those agencies, they tell our clients the same thing. Go to the county first, and then if they can't help you, we will try to help you. But these agencies do not provide the same services that the county does. For example, some of them will not provide money for temporary rent or assistance. Some of them will provide only utility assistance. Some of them will provide other types of assistance. But they provide very limited assistance because they are very limited in terms of being a nonprofit. The other issue about the mission, I suggest that some of you folks tour the mission and look at what this would be if you take your children there. Now, an adult who's got a problem, I have no problem with that. That's what the mission is for. It's temporary and can sometimes, in some cases, with our clients, provide some motivation to figure out another place to go. But to ask a single mom with two young children who are in school to take her children to live to the, at the mission because the county decides they come first before the county should help, I think is wrong. I think it's wrong legally, and I think it's wrong morally. So our appeal is that the other resources rule is being misused here and misinterpreted, and I think the county's responsibility to, for, to someone like my client would come before sending her to the mission, the Salvation Army, or community outreach. Thank you, Doug.
Uh, I think you might want to stay at the mic just for a minute because I'm sure there's questions. Uh, Commissioner Kelly? Mr. Cummings, you said tour the Gospel Mission, and I have. They have a separate floor, I believe it's third floor, that's for the women with children. I mean, she's, she, it's not in with a bunch of other people. She's in with the women that have children, if I believe. And I guess the only thing I take objection for is you are saying the government should solve all these problems and the nonprofits, uh, which are established for that very purpose, should not. Well, what you're describing to me, Commissioner, is a legislative problem. Well, the the problem law in too. South Dakota is clear that counties have a responsibility to help the poor and to give them assistance when they are in need. And for someone in need to come to that county who has a legal responsibility, ask for the very assistance that the law says the county must provide to say, no, you go to a private agency before you come to us, I think is wrong under the law. I'm not going to argue you know, philosophy in terms of how this is. Unfortunately, in South Dakota, this is the way the code is written. This is how it's done. Everything flows down to the bottom and the responsibilities are dumped on the counties, rightly or wrongly. But I hear what you're saying and I understand the concerns about government being involved, but in this case, the law says government should be involved. And I'm saying that if the law says the government should be involved, then when people, the county does have the right to decide its own eligibility requirements. That's true. But it has to be according to the statutory scheme. And what I'm saying is when a county takes a position that we don't have to help anybody until they go to all possible resources, private or public, I think that's a wrong interpretation of the law. If, if I were to agree with you on not having government involved, then that would require the legislature to change the law and for the state or other entities to be involved in some of these problems. My client, as I said, I think is exactly the kind of person who needs some temporary assistance. This happened through no fault of her own. I mean, the landlord thinks it's her fault because her pipes burst when she was out of town, but that's another argument. She has two small children. She is disabled, so she has limited options income-wise. She used her own resources, meaning what she had left of her own money to put her family up temporarily, and was only asking the county to supplement that temporarily while she was waiting to get her voucher approved so that she could port it to another city, preferably Rochester is what she's looking at, so she can be closer to the Mayo Clinic so she won't have this problem in the future. So I see my client as doing everything possible that she could do to try to help her situation, and that her request to the county is a temporary request based on circumstances, not her fault, and based on a, a legal system that says the county has this responsibility. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Commissioner Kelly. A little follow-up. Uh, does the law say the county is primary, or does the law say we are obligated to take care of them after all other means have been exhausted? Just, the law just simply says the county has a responsibility to help needy individuals. It also says the county can set up, take into consideration other government help, from other agencies and set up its own eligibility requirements, which, it ha which this county has done. This county has an elaborate uh, eligibility and regulations, which is probably the best in, of any county in the state, has appeal procedures, probably the best of any county in the state, and has you know, the, only, the only issue I have with the county is I don't believe that the system is set up so that the county can tell people to go to private agencies before they take their responsibility. I think it should be the opposite. That's an I think interpretation when someone, question, right? I think when someone comes to the county and the county offers or gives what they can give under their guidelines or says you don't meet our guidelines, then these people would go to Salvation Army, Community Outreach, or the Mission. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. <clears throat> Other questions for Mr. Cummings? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Carol, uh, do you have any rebuttal or any other comments to Mr. Cummings' comments? Um, no, nothing specific that's that's out there. And I certainly understand and respect the concerns that he has. Um, you have your guidelines that we've developed, and the guidelines that that we've utilized have always said we're of last resort. That is that is out there. So, and for our process, um, every time somebody comes into our office. Um, whether we say yes, no, we, or we're pending, whatever it is that's out there, people always receive a notice of action, an NOA 
is what we refer to. And we do work very cooperatively with the other nonprofits out there because they know when somebody comes in, they'll say, show me your NOA, because then they'll understand exactly what we've denied, what we've said yes to, what we've said no to in order to, in order to, in order to be on there. So um, the client did receive a referral to community outreach for gas, I believe, is what was in the notice of, uh, notice of assistance. That, um, because that's, they receive separate funding for doing that particular process. Any questions for Carol, Commissioner Barth? So, Carol, in this case, did the did the client uh, meet our income requirements for assistance? Let me just take you through that little bit of confusion. When she first came in, she filled out the application, and the application stated it was she and a child in the house. And in that particular in that let me get the notes in front of me. Um, in that particular conversation the guidelines for us and the guidelines for reference are the federal poverty levels for two people was one thousand two hundred ninety three dollars a month um, after everything was finished that was out there then she then stated no I actually have th two children in the household which was then added to the application but it was not on the original application and at that point the funding would go up to one thousand six hundred and twenty eight would be the monthly amount for an annual amount of sixteen thousand five hundred and thirty dollars so that was the confusion over that. So, but with the two children in the household, she would be just under guidelines under that. We do have, um, you know, unfortunately, this is something our staff deals with, to be honest, on a very daily basis that is, that is out there. Are there times that we will put somebody up in a hotel instead of, instead of using one of the other uh, private the nonprofits in town? Absolutely. Uh, for instance, one of the circumstances is that if the children are old enough that you've got a 13, 14, 15-year-old, child of the opposite sex of the parent that if you've got a mom with a 15 year old child or a father with a 15 year old with a daughter they're going to be split up into separate places and they aren't going to be able to stay together that's a circumstance where we would go through and, and see a motel as being a better alternative for them other comments or questions for Carol Commissioner Heiberger just a comment I spent two years learning Carol's job sort of <laughs> and that it has been our policy and I learned that from day one that we use other resources if we didn't use the other resources in the county it would cost us a whole lot more and we'd be serving a whole lot less people so we do work collaboratively with our neighbors other questions if not uh, I have a question for mr. Cummings or a couple if you will sure <clears throat> do you have any under reason why when the original application was done she first said she had one child and then changed it to two I think it was just confusion. I mean, she, my, if you met my client, she talks very fast and she's very stressed and she uh, sometimes talks over herself. I think there was just confusion between the worker and the and the uh, app, the person taking the application. I mean, I discovered the when I when I saw she'd been denied for income and I looked at our application, um, we use similar guidelines, although ours are a little higher. I called uh, I can't remember who I talked to at county and said, why is she over income guidelines? Is there a problem with it? And then I discovered that they had her down as one, not two. I said, well, she has two kids at home. Did you not know that? Well, no, because I, you know, and he said, well, I'll get back to you. And then he called and said, well, I think she said that on her old application and we use the old application or I don't know what it was, but there was a confusion there on the application process. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, the other piece that I, I read in the notes, I think, is there was some question about when she was evicted, there was some negligence alleged discussed, the alleged, yeah. if you will, I, uh, uh, we about do. the windows being left open and that's why the pipes froze or yeah. something. We do a considerable amount of landlord-tenant work at my office. I have never had a landlord who didn't say whatever damage was left was done by a tenant. And my client denies that. Okay. You know, and one of the problems when the county tried to negotiate for her was that the landlord said, yeah, I want 1400 and whatever to cover my insurance deductible and co-pays before there was any proof as to why the pipes burst. Okay. Because there was also a maintenance man who said he was in the place the same day she returned a few hours before and there was no bursting or flooding. So I guess the, the point is we don't know why pipes burst. Usually they burst because that's it's too cold or whatever, but I, I can't tell you. Okay. But to prove that would be who knows. Thank you, Doug. Any other questions, comments from anyone, uh, audience or from the commission, Commissioner Barth? 
So, uh, for Carol, a question. Certainly. Again. So, Carol, by the by, the newer data there with two children, uh, her her income is below uh, below that number. So she would normally qualify for our assistance, right? Well, there's one except the one in our guidelines, which we which we bring, and those have not changed since I've been at the county. The guidelines state that if somebody receives a social security check or disability check, that type of thing, that that. Um, let me get the right language out for you, the back of the memo I copied that onto. Um, obligation in the presence of public assistance. The county shall consider all other forms of public assistance benefits, federal and state, in determining eligibility. The receipt of federal, state, or other assistant funds, such as but not limited to Social Security, may be considered satisfaction in whole of the county's obligation under SDCL 28-13. So, so typically, if somebody receives that Social Security check, we don't subsidize them also through count, through additional tax dollars. Okay. Could I make a comment on that also? Certainly. See, that's, that, I have a big problem with that also. Doug, so I'll have you start over when you get to the mic. Okay. We, we don't pick up everything in the audience. Um, my problem with that policy is that if you have a part-time job and you're making $878 a month, then you get help from the county. If you get a Social Security check for $878 a month, then you don't. And what's the rational basis for that? There isn't one. It's just another way to make it. I under, look, I have a, I have, I'm sensitive to the county's problems with the amount of money you spend on this. And you're the biggest county in the state, and you're, you're uh, because of the way we're growing, we're growing in every facet, including the po poor population. So I understand all of that. But I'm just saying that it, this particular situation, and if I didn't understand it, you'd see me here a lot more, and you don't. <laughs> um, I think this particular situation cries out for some assistance under these circumstances. And to say that because you get a check from Social Security and you're disabled through no fault of your own, because you're not working and making the same amount of money, you can't get help, or because you could take your children to the mission and, and live in a dorm or whatever and then get them to school. They're, all, they're enrolled in school, which is another issue, that you shouldn't, you know, you should have to take their help first and not help them is contrary to what county poor relief is about, if you read the whole section of the law there. So really that's my position, and I, I just have problems with the county interpreting their responsibility by using things like Social Security disability, I don't have a problem taking it into consideration. But if you still don't get enough money through disability to make it to the poverty level, then that should qualify you for help from somebody. And she's getting the help she can get. She's used her own resources. She went to the places that she could go to. And I think she should have been helped. It's just that simple. Thank you. You're a nice guy, but we like to see you infrequently. <laughs> Other questions for either? Uh, Carol, please. Just to, just to follow up to Doug's comment, and I would agree with you, is that so nobody's going to get rich off Social Security or disability payments that are out there. But typically, if you do have those, then you probably have Medicare or Medicaid that comes along with it. You've, you've gotten into the system, so you probably have food stamps and, and low-income housing that goes along into it also. So, And that's uh, part of the recognition that goes into it. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who either fall into that category of very low income, whether they receive government assistance or whether they are working. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Peckis. I'm going to float a motion. I don't know if I'll get a second, but I'm going to make a motion to uh, uh, defer this until there's been a determination from HUD as to whether or not the voucher is going to be transferable. Is there a second to Commissioner Peckis's motion? Uh, dies for a lack of a second. Any other motions or comments? If I might, uh, Kristen, uh, go ahead, Commissioner Kelly. I'll make a motion to deny the request. A second. We have a motion to deny the request. Other comments? I would like to make comments, but go ahead and ask your question, Kirsten. I was going to ask uh, <clears throat> Kirsten for his legal opinion on uh, this particular statute. I think that's really the bottom line for all this conversation. So if you would, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess this does come down to issue of uh, interpreting our county policy as whether that's consistent with statute. Um, as I understand it, and I can refer you to uh, 
uh, statute uh, 28-1-18, and that uh, addresses duplication of public assistance and exhaustion of uh, other sources of, of assistance. And uh, part of the text of that statute, if I may, um, says no person is eligible for any assistance or services from the state of South Dakota or its agencies or subdivisions, which we are, until that person has exhausted all other sources of assistance or services available to the person or for which the person would be eligible if the person applied. In the list of entities uh, mentioned in that statute, it does mention private entities. So I believe, I believe that's, it's my legal opinion that the county's policy is consistent with that statute. Thank you. Um, yeah, comment? I'm sorry, Dick. Commissioner um, Kelly? Just in defense of my motion, even at Safe House, which these guys are the poorest of the poor, uh, if they have an income source, such as Social Security or SSI or something like that, uh, we do charge them a rent based on their income so you know it might only be 50 or 100 dollars a month but they they do have an obligation if they got some in course income resources it states in our policy that the county assistance shall be resource, a resource of last resort and uh, and it goes on but i you know i disagree that we shouldn't look to the nonprofits, the churches and the other kind of aid to people and then if they can't, if it's all gone there, then yes, we're, we're, we're obligated to pay it or support it. But this lady has got uh, a reasonably, you know, not good income, but I mean, she's, you'll notice in the, in the comments, um, she has several sources with SSI and SNAP and CS, which I don't know what that is. That's $400 a month. So uh, I, I just, you know, I, I, would defend Union Gospel. They're doing a terrific mission for this town, taking care of a lot of people on a temporary basis, and that's what they're there for. And it, uh, I think it's a nice facility for considering what we're doing. This, the Gospel Mission takes no government funds, to my knowledge, and uh, I think that's the way this country was built and should continue. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. And other comments? Commissioner Barth? I would uh, say I'm very sympathetic with the uh, person in this case and her family. Um, at the same time, I would say uh, this county does subsidize uh, some of these non-governmental organizations which step in and do work that we would otherwise have to start a whole new department to do ourselves. And uh, So sharing the burden with them uh, does not seem uh, out of the ordinary to me uh, because, again, we we do work with many of these. Uh, having served on the Homeless Advisory Board, uh, I can tell you that there are a dozen or more groups that work on, on this type of issue, and many of them uh, get some assistance from the county. Thank you. Other comments? Commissioner Peckis. Uh, well, Mr. Cummings is right, and Mr. Cummings is wrong, because you're absolutely right, Kirsten, when you read 28-1-18, it does specifically list private entities under the state statute. And one of the things in the briefing memo, or at least that it, the facts as renditioned by uh, uh, Mr. Cummings, indicated that currently under HUD, we don't have a decision yet related to the voucher. And if she gets the voucher, then she's exercised and gotten some more benefits under 28118, which then would free up a little bit of money. And I think she intends to relocate to Phoenix and uh, get out of Sioux Falls. That exercising of those benefits actually would keep her, I believe, out of the purview of Minneapolis County being in the service of providing to the poorest of the poor those benefits. If that, if that voucher is denied, then she doesn't have access to those particular funds. And so one of my ideas regarding deferring this is that if she's denied, then we look at the possibility of trying to see if she qualifies for those benefits because then she will have exhausted all of her benefits. At this point, at least from the rendition of the facts from Mr. Cummings, this is her last potential remedy that she's trying to exhaust right now. Now, I, I may be wrong. Uh, but, but there's also a potential appeal process that he can bring out of, out of this particular hearing as well. But I know he's trying to exhaust all the remedies, uh, but in looking at state statute and looking at the appeal that's over at HUD, I think that uh, uh, 
it would be mindful on the part of this commission to take that into consideration. If she is denied, then she really is up a stream without a paddle. And uh, I just want to make sure that this county goes on the record to understanding the plight of some of our constituents and that we do acknowledge that. But I understand that you should be getting a decision by the end of the week, but if the will of the commission is just to deny this at this point, I'm sure Mr. Cummings can take it to the next level as well, and maybe she will get that voucher and be able to relocate to uh, down to Phoenix where she has some other uh, support systems available. Thank you, John. Any other comments? Commissioner Barth, are you going to? I, I'm just going to say I don't plan to support it at this time. I'm not sure what the correct solution is, but uh, I just have a hard time uh, denying it at this time. Well, I'm going to take a second for chair privilege because I can do that, I think, without getting kicked out of here. Um, I agree with John. I think we one week wouldn't make a big difference, and that would make a big difference in her life. Frankly, I would have supported uh, Mr. Cummings' action until I read or didn't read but heard uh, Kirsten read 28-1-18, which I think is clear on where the county's responsibilities are and we have to follow law that's what we were all sworn in to do uh, I think waiting a week would have been a better option uh, but I hope that you uh, understand that uh, frankly uh, this is one of those most sensitive things that uh, county has to deal with and unfortunately uh, this particular individual is uh, in some real difficult circumstances and um, Hopefully, uh, she'll come to some conclusion that will help her with her uh, long-range goal of becoming independent. With that, uh, we have a motion and a second, I believe. Roll call. To deny the uh, uh, request, and we will go to a roll call vote. Commissioner Barth? No. Heiberger? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Peckus? No. Venega? No. Mr. Chairman, I'd move to defer for a week. I'll second. For some reason, I had that gut feeling that would happen. <laughs> um, Roll call vote. We have a motion and a second to defer for a week. Those, I'm sorry, oh, go ahead. I was going to say. You're ready. <laughs> I'm never ready. Commissioner Barth? Yes. Heiberger? Yes. Kelly? No. Peckus? Yes. Venega? Yes. Mr. Cummings, you have one week to solve this problem. <laughs> Gee whiz, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, were kidding when we said we didn't really want to see you regularly, so I think we go to item number 11. Item 11 is to authorize the chairman to sign an agreement with JSA Engineering and Land Surveyors for preliminary engineering, plan preparation, and bidding for concrete pavement restoration and joint repair on Minnehaha County Highway 142 between Powderhouse Road and South Dakota Highway 11. DJ Boothy. Good morning, Commissioners. DJ Boothy, Highway Superintendent. Uh, this agreement is the first uh, agreement for a project that we have that was discussed two weeks ago that wasn't on the original approved budget for 2013. Uh, this project was identified because of uh, se severe maintenance needs that are needed on power or on uh, uh, South Dakota 142. 142 is commonly referred to as Madison Street as it leaves uh, Sioux Falls and goes over towards Brandon. Uh, it's in, inside the city limits of Sioux Falls, it is Madison Street. So I think we're all pretty familiar with that area. It is um, pretty rough and the last couple of years has had some pretty bad frost heave problems and, and significant deterioration of concrete pa uh, pavement. So uh, we're hoping to do a, a repair project on that this year. Um, the city of Sioux Falls has advised us on, on ways to approach this project and they have used JSA engineers for a couple projects in the last couple of years and they've done a pretty good job for them. And, and so we're hoping that we can hire them to prepare plans and specs for us. And, and get that project rolling. So if you have any questions, I can answer them now. Any questions for DJ? <clears throat> so this was Mr. not a RFP or bid deal? No, this was, we didn't do an RFP. For What's this. the cap? But I, I know it's got Okay, the, the contract for professional services is $25,100. Yeah, what, what, what's the level at which we have to go out for? 
There is no statutory requirement. None? Okay, thank you. That's all I need to know. For this area, because it's considered professional services, there is not an RFP or bid requirement on this. We're bringing it to you because your county policy does state that contracts of this amount need to be approved by the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Other questions for DJ? If not, is there a motion? Motion Thank to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve and a second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item 12 is to authorize the chairman to sign an agreement between Minnehaha County and Sod Busters Radio Control Model Airplane Club. DJ Boothy. Morning again, commissioners. Uh, as you have approved in the past, uh, Sod Busters is requesting another uh, formal agreement to utilize the uh, gravel pit property as a location to operate motor airplanes uh, with their club. And they have a, a pretty nice setup over there that they've uh, been using for several years. And this current agreement we have changed from the previous uh, four-year term to a two-year term. And uh, that was at the request of the commission office, and and the <coughs> department supports that. Uh, we we think that they make um, pretty good neighbors over there, and, and we have had zero issues whatsoever. So um, we support the agreement the way that it is written. I know that they do have representatives here that they may, may wish to make a request to uh, modify the term of the agreement, but. Um, as far as the agreement goes, if you have any questions, I can answer them, or if you would like them to speak, that's okay, too. Any questions for DJ? If not, if there's someone here from the group that would like to make any comments or respond to the um, revision, that would be great. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Kurt Anderson, president of the Sodbuster Club. Uh, like Kurt, to, uh, we need your address, too. I'm sorry. Uh, my, my personal address? You can give us whatever address okay. you want. All right. <laughs> I, we'll I, find you wherever you are. Okay. I live at 6512 West 52nd Street okay. in, in Sioux Falls. And uh, I'd like to thank the, the county for letting us use that land. Uh, we've used it for several years, and uh, we have 35 active members who, who, who fly off it year-round. And uh, I guess the only change I'd, I'd like to ask is to go from a two back to a four-year agreement, just just to uh, just to save uh, the time of doing this every two years. Uh, it, it can be canceled at 60 days uh, on either party if if it needs to be canceled. Uh, but otherwise, we really appreciate using that land, and and uh, we we maintain it, we mow it, and and do weed control, and uh, and we have a fun fly once a year. Thank That's all, all, all I have for comments. Thank you, Kurt. Commissioner Kelly? I don't know if it's indicated. I'm guessing that the reason for the shorter term is we're still in the process of trying to figure out where the highway building is going to possibly be relocated. And, and so we don't really want to go out four years on, on anything, if, just in case. That, that was one of the sites originally considered. Uh, it hasn't been in the top number, but I think that's probably the primary reason for the two-year. I don't think you're going to have any problem getting it approved. Commissioner Heiberger? I'm just wondering if there's a clause in here that says we can break the contract in 60 days. Why does it matter if it's two to four? There must have been a reason. Anybody want to speak to that? <laughs> Cindy, it's, it's my understanding that the commission was just uncomfortable with the long-term contracts in general, and that okay. was the reason that the, the four-year got changed to a two. I mean, we because of the clause, we'd be okay with a tenure. We, d we don't have any issue with them being out there. Okay. Commissioner Barth? Does the state's attorney have any opinion on that? As long as that 60-day uh, uh, mutual mm -hmm. cancel provision is in there, um, really there's no difficulties presented by a longer term. Um, but I believe maybe the intent was just to have these uh, contracts brought more regularly before you just out of an awareness point of view as to what's out there and what's binding us that's my understanding of why we reduce those terms commissioner kelly i'd you. move to accept the agreement as written or as presented we have a motion do we have a second 
the motion dies for a lack of a second. Commissioner Barth? Um, I move to amend the agreement to four years and approve it. Second. We have a motion and a second to amend the agreement to four years. We'll vote. Do we have to vote on the amendment first? There's no amendment. Not it's really? Just a, there's just there's a no change? Motion. It's just a new motion. Just a motion. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think you can fly by every four years and drop the contract off. <laughs> uh, Remotely. Yep. We have no drones. We have a motion for four year I think I lost control. <laughs> we have uh, we have a four year agreement with the uh, group, the Sodbusters Radio Control Airplane Club. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes, so we'll see you in four years. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your patience, too. Item number 13 is consider a motion to concur with recommendation of the chairman to appoint Dick Kelly to the Minnehaha County Housing and Redevelopment Commission for a five-year term. Robert Wilson. Good morning, Commissioners. Robert Wilson of the Commission Office. Uh, the County Housing and Redevelopment Commission was created by a resolution of this commission back in uh, February of 2010, and the uh, Housing and Redevelopment Commission is the limited partner in the Safe Home Limited Partner. Uh, the Safe Home LP is the legal owner of the facility that, <coughs> the, excuse me, that the Safe Home program operates out of up at uh, Third in Minnesota. Just a little bit of background, this um, uh, ownership structure was required as part of the uh, construction financing package using low-income housing tax credits. So that's the, the reason that this uh, uh, group was created and, and is needed. Um, the resolution creating the five member board uh, set initial terms of the five members at staggered lengths one year, two years, three years, and four years. Uh, Commissioner Kelly, who serves as the chairman of the HRC, was um, elected or, or appointed with a three-year term. So his, his term is up this year. Moving forward, all uh, future terms will be for a, a period of five years. And the uh, um, process is appointment by the commission chair with concurrence by the rest of the commission. And so that's what we have before you this morning, asking for uh, concurrence with uh, 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 chairman's recommendation to uh, reappoint Commissioner Kelly for a uh, new five-year term on the HRC. Thank you, Robert. Uh, any questions of Robert? Or a motion to approve Commissioner Kelly to a five-year term? Given the fact that he's not here, I say I'll make a motion to appoint him. <laughs> second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. He's out there roaming the halls, so. though. He's close enough. Yeah, you. he's close enough. <laughs> he did say for the record he thought he should step down. Uh, I, I agree. <laughs> Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. I'm going to note that Commissioner Kelly abstained. <laughs> <laughs> it's a heck of a pay increase. We could have appointed him yeah. more stuff while he was yeah, gone. That's right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Item number 14 is a briefing on proposed changes to long range planning process and annual budget process provisions in Minnehaha County Policy and Procedure Manual. Ken McFarland. Good morning. Um, last year, during the budget hearing processes, uh, the Commission had requested that we take a look at some potential changes, uh, and fairly minor ones, I would, would say, about how we start to prepare you for budget hearings. And so, and as you know, uh, we do have um, we do have in our county policies and procedures manual a section that talks about preparation of the annual budget and our long-range planning process. Uh, again, I would remind you, last year you really focused on two or on four things. Number one, you wanted to bring some consistency to how department heads submit their long-range plan information. You're also looking for an earlier time when we could start looking at revenue estimates for the upcoming budget year. You also talked about a new format to the application um, that outside agencies use and submit to the county when they're requesting uh, uh, funds from the county. And you also wanted to establish 
a formal process and an established procedure on how you review the salaries for the elected officials. And that's particularly important because, number one, elected officials don't get step increases like every other person in the county. And so you wanted to establish and, you know, when that would happen, when you would look at that for elected <coughs> officials. And also perhaps establish a procedure for how you implement the salary of a new elected official in, that, in the county, and when that would happen. So uh, what we've done, um, we've, I've submitted to you a copy of the proposed changes that we would use for both the long-range planning process and for the budget submission process. And you'll notice that the first changes that we did incorporate was that we wanted to, we wanted the department heads to use and submit their responses to the long-range plan questionnaire, which is a fairly standardized document that looks at a number of things in a standardized format. Now, I've already met with department heads and have shared that with them and have and distributed that. And again, the only there's really no changes in that document except for one minor thing that I will show you. Uh, but it's just a standardized format for the department heads to submit their long-range plan information so that when you're reviewing it, there's some consistency and you know where to look for each and every department. The only other change in this um, particular section as well is that, again, one of the things that we do with this information in our early budget estimates in, in early May is when we uh, present the long-range plan in our early revenue estimates to you uh, so that you can start preparing for your budget hearings. And one of the things that we ins inserted in this section was simply saying that information presented during this presentation is that you may use that information to direct how budgets may be submitted uh, by the department heads within the parameters of the county's current financial situation. So that it just gives you an earlier head start on how uh, and what we are seeing financially before departments submit budgets. We've done that routinely through uh, um, a number of years. Now we're just putting it in as part of the procedures. When we look at the annual budget process, one of the main changes, uh, again, I'll just walk you through it. Again, we wanted to um, do the preliminary revenue estimates that we do for the budget uh, we want to do that by April 1. And that now this year, I know uh, the auditor's office is in fact working on those estimates already. And, uh, and again, we want to stress those are preliminary projections as we go this. But typically, we may not start this process in years past till sometime in May. So we're starting at uh, about a month early gathering our revenue estimates. The other change that you talked about is the um, redoing the outside agency application. This was also something that we would normally send out in May, but to prep for an earlier time, it would be our intent to send these, uh, these applications out in early April so we could see what kind of requests we were going to get from the multitude of agencies that we fund. And then um, the rest of the changes in this, in this section are, are really, um, we're just simply saying, by May 1, we are going to start distributing information to the department heads, which is also current practice and procedure. We're just doing some simple clarifications in this, in this area. Uh, the one thing we are working on with IT in this area, right now departments, when they submit their budget forms, and that they may, it requires the, the um, auditor's office to do a lot of manual entry into the numbers that are submitted by the department heads uh, to the auditor's office. So the auditor's office goes through a tremendous amount of work, you know, taking those notes from those department heads and, and separately entering all those annotations to those department budgets. As you know, we've rolled out for you in the past the department head menu where department heads can look at their past expenditures uh, for all their ASNs. And the IT department is working on a program right now which will allow department heads when they submit their budget to do it electronically and submit that to the auditor's office and we can avoid all of that uh, 
um, manual entry that's required by the auditor's office right now. Should be a huge time saver. We hope IT hopes to show the department heads that new format and that new procedure here uh, in about mid-April. And that's so that's, I think, a very productive change that's coming down the pike. That'll make it a lot easier for department heads and definitely much easier for the auditor's office uh, when they get all our budget numbers um, from us all at once. The only other change to the current policy, and, that, and we added it right at the very end, is how you take a look at salaries um, and when you take a look at salaries for the elected officials. And again, I stress because elected officials don't get a step increase, and so um, we wanted to formulate the time uh, and what items would be considered when you make adjustments to the flat rate of salary for our elected officials. Um, the one thing I also uh, wanted to point out, and it's consistent with state law, is that under no circumstances may you adjust the salary of an elected department head uh, during the term of their office or consecutive terms of office. You can't lower their salaries once it's been established. The other, the other uh, part of the policy, and I know this was of big interest to the commission, is how do you set the, the salary for a um, newly elected um, official? And under this proposal is that the commission may adopt a salary for that newly elected official based upon you know, the, the recognition that it may take a while to get up to speed and that uh, to, to have them become fully proficient in the job that you may um, start them up at, le at a 10% less than the established flat rate for that um, position. But if you do that, there is a process is that every year they're adjusted by 2.5% until they get to that flat rate um, that's established for the, the elected official. So um, that's the major change in, that in, in our review. Now consistent with that, I just wanted to show you a couple of, of different things. This is a copy of the long range questionnaire form that we did develop. You'll notice that it does talk about all of the things that are already in the long-range plan document. We're just simply, for consistency purposes, want everybody to submit their information the same so that you can uh, review it much, much easier and we can certainly do our totals and tallies much easier too. This is on an Excel spreadsheet. The only difference, oops, I want to de-switch. The only difference that we wanted um, to put on this form that uh, some people have talked about is on part F where it talks about units of service. That was one of the big things that the Commission wanted to look at last year is for the departments to tell you what are their units of service and in fact they may vary from year to year but it gives you a kind of an idea of what the departments involved with and what they see as uh, increases in some of their critical areas. Now, for instance, in equalization, that unit of service may be the number of building permits that they that they did. It might be the number of properties that are uh, that they're responsible to assess, and that for um, the register of deeds, it may be the number of documents filed for the uh, well, treasurer's office. It may be the number of um, um, license plates issues, etc. And so what we've asked is for each department to identify what are their core units of service and describe them, you know, so that you have an understanding of what those are and then to make those projections so that you have an idea of, of you know, where their challenges and um, get a better understanding of their particular department. So that's really the only change that we've asked when people submit the long range plan. On the outside agency application for funding. One of the things we did is we actually added a separate page so that everybody's using the same format when they submit their revenue request so that we can see where are they getting their money. You know, not only from the county, is it from the city, United Way, grants, special fundraisers, etc. 
And we also uh, asked them to list their, their budgeted expenditures for the past few years and what they're requesting. And you can see the breakdown that we came up with, which we think is fairly comprehensive and should catch almost all of the uh, um, expense requests that would be out there. So again, we wanted to provide some consistency here. One of the things that we're doing here is what we're no longer requiring because of our advent of using the, the iPads and things like that for your, we're not requesting multiple copies of things from people. And that, so you submit it once, we have it, it's easily dis disseminated. And so those are really the only major changes um, that, we've, that we've implemented. And again, these were based on your discussions um, last year during budget hearings. The one thing I want to reiterate, you know, we did go ahead because of time constraints and ask department heads to, take, to start using at least the long range plan format for uh, consistency purposes. And that, but the rest of this, um, it would be our intent, just we, we wanted to brief you on what we're proposing and kind of the direction that we're going. We're not asking you to adopt today. This is just simply a briefing. And if you would like to incorporate any of these changes so that we can put it in the policies and procedures manual, we'd look at that for next week. So um, at this juncture, um, if you, I'd be happy to stand by for any questions. But uh, I hope that we've met your expectations that you expressed last year. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Commissioner Peckis? Well, I support everything that you wrote down, Ken, but I will not support the uh, withholding of money from elected uh, individuals uh, at Minneapolis County. Um, you know, if you're the sheriff or the state's attorney and you're running for that position and you're going to start off at 90% of what the position was, and then the next year you'll get 92 and a half, the next year 95, the next draft of that 97. At the end of four years, I did the quick math. From the first year, we're basically withholding close to 25%. Well, it is 25% if you add it up. And I have a huge issue with that because when we hire a department head, we don't sit there and tell those people, you're going to have to take a 10% pay cut. We don't do that. We have a completely different system and it's not consistent across the board. And so I have a huge issue with the idea of just because you run an election, you get elected, somehow you should tithe and lose your income for the sole purpose when if I'm an unelected department head, we don't make those people take the position with a 10% pay cut to grow into it. That just, to me, seems arbitrary and capricious. When people get state jobs or city jobs, they don't get their money withheld from them for the established pay. It's very regressive, and I don't support it. May I respond to that? Certainly. In a way, you kind of do. And that because um, for, and I'll, and I'll just take myself for example. I, I'm on a step and grade plan, mm -hmm. and, that, and that step and grade plan, I move up that chain, uh, uh, you know, if I have good job performance, but there's, there's a natural progression there, and that because of the step, and because of my years of service. It's highly likely that when I retire, when I retire, that and when you go looking for someone, you are going to bring that department head at a um, lower level, you know, maybe a lower step than what I'm currently at. So they will start more than likely at a lower salary. Now you have the ability to, of course, hire them up to I think step four, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the hiring process. But you do bring highly likely, and by practice, we do bring them at a lower level. With elected officials not being on that step and grade right. plan, and that. There's, um, uh, there's not that ability. And so with this proposal, at least, and it doesn't say you have to, but you may review this and you may bring them in at a lower level, consistent with what you would do with other new, you know, non-elected department heads who are new to the position. But because they're not on a step, there is a procedure to bring them up to speed quickly. And that's all, that's all they were attempting to do here, is to recognize that inequity that right now there is no way for an uh, elected official to move like that. 
Except, may I ask a question? Certainly. But if we review those salaries and look at what the market is bearing, we make those adjustments, and we've done that before, where we've increased people's salaries. So I guess I, I understand your position, but I still say that people need to know how much the position is that they're running for. And, and this says that when we are doing, when you have a, uh, a position <coughs> that's going to be a newly elected position, that's exactly what you have to do. And you, you have to review it, and you have to make that determination then whether or not you're going to adopt this or not. You certainly still have the latitude to say, nope, we're doing it. But this is an option to recognize that folks coming in, or you know, depending on the, uh, 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 if you get a whole flux of new people, may not understand the complexities of the position. So it just gives you that, that ability. I'm sorry, Ken, you haven't sold me. I understand I your position, you. but I, I'm just, what I'm just reluctant. Yeah. To do. And quite mm -hmm. frankly, um, the recommendation for this is just has bubbled up from discussions that uh, have come from this table. That's how the policy I, was developed. I understand, but may I just when I buy a candy bar and I expect to get a full size Snickers bar, and I get the wrapper and I open it up and it's a fun size bar, there's nothing <laughs> fair about that. So anyway, that's just my own perspective. Sure. I think if you use the analogy of a bag of nuts rather than a candy bar, everybody would kind of understand this group right up here. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Kelly? I, I respectfully disagree with my colleague. I, I, I want to commend you on this. This is my fifth budget year going in, and, and this is by far going to be much more understanding and complete for the commission, and I... I imagine you and the auditor's office put this all together, and I, well, and, uh, uh, I really want to commend right. you on it. I think it's great. <clears throat> Just take the thing. Take, and again, take it and don't argue it. We are not asking <laughs> for approval today. No. Thank you. Commissioner Barth. It's difficult to build up a lot of enthusiasm for budgets. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would say that I... I I like that section on uh, the full-time elected officials. And, you know, when we hire a replacement for Ken, I doubt if we will hire them at step one of his grade, but we won't hire them at the same step that Ken is at. And, uh, you know, when we hire department heads, we hire qualified people. When we elect them, that's not necessarily true. Um, <laughs> not saying that, but we, you can, but we, could be living we don't know. I could wind up being, you know, uh, go to law school and be elected uh, county attorney and you know without any experience and and that would be uh, a travesty uh, it won't be me but uh, I think that elected department heads us you know sometimes don't come in with the experience that we would hire a highway superintendent somehow I don't think that came out like you wanted it to. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <coughs> any other comments that are inappropriate and again, I just would like to stress, I mean, this was simply developed by um, um, what has bubbled up from the table. I mean, I, we've shared this with the elected officials, you know, we, we've gotten some comment back which we've tried to incorporate into, uh, into this, and that, um, um, but again, I mean, I certainly respect uh, Commissioner Pectus' viewpoint in that, uh, but again, we, we brought this up and that based on the conversation of what we've heard. And that's why, you know, we're briefing you today. It's something to think about, and it's certainly um, subject to um, either rejection or amendment or whatever, uh, when you perhaps look at it uh, next week. You know, again, certain things, and I think this is really the guts of what your debate will be, certain things I think you can, of the other parts of the policy, like the standardized format that we're trying to do for the long-range plan. And, moving the revenue estimate dates and the new forms that we've created for the outside agency application. Those are things that I think are really more administrative in nature and you know we're doing it to assist you in the budget process. And so some of those things like the long range plan document, we've already put that out and are kind of moving towards that already. Same with um, um, doing the, uh, a new format for department heads to submit their budgets electronically so that we avoid an extremely time-consuming process of trying to download all that information, uh, each and every entry by hand. And that, and so I think I, I, my hat's off to IT for really coming up with a good solution on that. So. Absolutely. Any other comments? 
Ken, thank you for all your work uh, in this. And to Darlene and Rich, we appreciate all your support. I think sometimes we need to take a before picture of the budget and you and then look an, an after picture to see if there's any major changes because uh, they are a huge support to what we do. And I do thank IT for bringing up all of this information electronically rather than manually, if you will. And it also gives us comparative documentation, which is extremely important. And the other changes that were made, I appreciate it from the department staff. Any department heads or, or anybody else here that has any comments that they Pam's may here. <laughs> I didn't mean you, Pam. I might say that I think you created this problem when we and we had this debate when we did the comp salary compensation study, and at that point, elected officials didn't support being taken off the step increase. I agree with um, John in that I think that the statute does say what people are supposed to start out. I think people who run for that job do it. I didn't even know what I got paid, so it wasn't my only decision, but. I also, I guess I don't know this, but how does it deal with county commissioners? So surely a first year county commissioner isn't as valuable as one who's been here 20 years. Well, I do believe that there is a learning curve for just about any kind of job, but I don't necessarily think that uh, they intended for you to decide what the, on a, otherwise you're kind of stuck in that rut. You never get any increase unless the county commissioners um, feel like they want to give you one and you know it's possible that county commissioners may not like you personally and then they may decide that you shouldn't have any kind of an increase and I think that that's sort of arbitrary and capricious so I think that um, everything said I think that we should allow people to have steps and I think the statute says what elected officials are supposed to get paid but that in mind um, even for yourselves first year first week not the same as 20 years um, for example, I've been on a school board, served in the legislature, um, served as a public utilities commission. I have sort of a huge breadth of uh, seeing government at many different levels. Um, I think even in terms of the market, when you look at hiring a department head, um, uh, it's still affected by what the market will bear. and. I would like to think that maybe we'd replace Ken for somebody cheaper, but chances are you probably won't because sometimes you get what you pay for. And I'm sure you're going to be looking for somebody more experienced than some beginning person. So um, I just thought I'd share with you my concerns. Um, I'm happy to live with whatever you decide. Thank Mr. you, Pam. Mr. Pam, can I ask you a question? I think sure. Mr. Kelly was first. Thank you. Uh, Sorry. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the statute says the minimum you pay a elected official. Mm -hmm. I think we can pay and we do pay much more than the statute allows. Yeah, you can. But I think that should, I don't know. No, you know what I think, so. Yep. Thank you, uh, I guess I have a Commissioner quick question. Packers. You know, Pam, we have elected department heads that have been here for quite some time, but if in your first term, the first year, your pay was withheld 10%, and then the second year it was 7.5%, the third was 5%, the last was 2.5%, the way it was drawn up, uh, if you look at that and then you're reelected and you get the full amount years down the road If you find out another elected department head didn't have that imposed Would that give you a chip on your shoulder? Probably I agree The other point is here though that I think that I think I, I, I admit that there is a learning curve But I also think that the public decides whether or not you I agree they are the people that we allow to mm -hmm. decide on your job performance one way or the other. Uh, he didn't say that you five should decide this. They said that the public at large should decide this. Yep. And I guess if they think I did a poor job, they have an opportunity in four years to get rid of me. And I think I have to run on my record. If it was good, it was good. And if it was bad, they'll also notice that. Because generally speaking, I think people do take note. So. Other comments? With her breadth of experience, maybe she'd like Ken's job. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> uh, again, this was just a briefing, if you will, so there's no decisions that will be made today. Um, without the conversation about the uh, pay increases, I think the rest of it is a step in the right direction in providing information to all of us to make good decisions. and. Uh, 
I appreciate the staff's work in making that happen. And Darlene and Rich, and we do appreciate your support. You guys are awesome to deal with, and uh, you do a lot of work for us, so thank you. Uh, other comments? Otherwise, we'll go to the, the Commissioner Liaison Reports. Commissioner Barth? I actually want to make a comment on a number of items. Uh, so. Uh, I just re recently got back from the spring workshop out in Pierre, as did Commissioner Heiberger, and I, uh, there are a few things I'd just like to touch on. Uh, we had uh, Larry Zimmerman from the Veterans uh, State Veterans uh, Department talking about veterans' courts, which are possibly coming our way. Talked about the veterans' home in the Hot Springs, which looks like a nice facility. One thing they talked about was getting a list of all the veterans in the state, uh, which the state does not have. And uh, of course, many are passing away from earlier conflicts, but more are being created all the time. Um, we had a uh, presentation on emergency operations, and uh, one of the things they commented on was not to go outside the chain of command on, on spending, because you might get stuck with the bills. Uh, they said, for example, if you need a, a thousand road closed sign, uh, signs, and uh, you know, if the proper way is to go through the uh, emergency operation person, but if you happen to know the governor and call him separately, and you wind up with two thousand road closed signs, you're going to get the bill, and uh, uh, the FEMA and stuff like that won't reimburse. Um, we had uh, Dean Dayton from the legislative audit, uh, audit people. Uh, gave his final uh, thing to us, uh, he's retiring. And one thing he commented on was that uh, while there's a limit to the reserves that we can have, we can also have a fund for a specific building project and thus exceed the, the reserve limitation. So we would be able to save up you know, $500,000 for a project that we anticipated building in a couple of years. Finally, uh, Deb Bowman talked to us about Medicaid expansion for the state, and for the state to fully take on the burden that's been suggested would cost $37 million. And while I think the argument was that while that would save individual counties possibly, you know, millions, it probably wouldn't save $37 million for the 64 counties across the state. And so uh, at this point, they're not going to do it. And, uh, uh, Basically, that's it. And Cindy, do you have any? I'm going to make a Heiberg. comment. Absolutely. Um, I think they said for every 1% increase in change, it was going to cost an additional $7 million. And the people that would be covered under the Medicaid were the people that it would just increase with people who were able-bodied and not covered by insurance and adults. No, children have all been covered, adult, um, senior citizens have all been covered. So the ones that would be covered under the additional $37 million are the people who don't have insurance but are able-bodied in, in most cases working. Thank you. Other comments, Commissioner Kelly? Well, just a couple. Um, in detox, the team is coming in Wednesday. Is that correct, Ken? Nope. Yes. Okay. And uh, we'll probably know Thursday whether or not we're going to get accreditation. Um, They've been working hard. Carol's been working hard with uh, with a uh, representative of the state and a representative of CCS. So uh, I don't know. We went through the other day and it looked to me like we're pretty much on track. All they have to do is be following the rules when they come in to inspect or to uh, audit. Uh, emergency management. Uh, they assisted in that Baltic fire, which was a pretty good sized fire. And I think you all got a thing on the drowning and the resources we committed there and. Uh, they were substantial, so that's the end. My only comment is dealing with auditors for 20 some years plus. You never know what an auditor is going to say until you get it in writing. So we'll wait and see what uh, happens in this process. Uh, and obviously they have their own uh, due diligence to perform that we're not involved with. So they look at it as a independent neutral agency so we'll look forward to that conversation I will suggest suggest that uh, um, I did get a letter from the South Dakota Association of County Commissioners asking for a commissioner or its designee from the county to attend 
uh, Veterans and Military Affairs Committee. So, Commissioner Iver. I was going to bring it up under new business. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I would just suggest that we put it on the agenda for next week, and um, I would suggest that we consider Pat Krupa, who works with the Veterans Affairs in her human services, and I think she's the most knowledgeable person that we're going to have in the county. So. I think that's a great suggestion. I think if you would mind talking to her about that, uh, or I can either one, but we will put it on next week's agenda if that's okay. But I think she would be an awesome designee from Minnehaha County. Any other liaison reports? I apologize for interrupting yours. If not, any new business? Kyle. Tax man cometh. <laughs> <laughs> I have that song on my iPad. <laughs> uh, just more of a briefing memo, and you will receive a more detailed and informative memo for the boards of equalization. I know everyone looks forward to those. They do start April 9th. We are this week receiving any objections or appeals to the county board of equalization. Last week were all of the local boards throughout the entire county and the city of Sioux Falls for, if you read in the paper, about three and a half days. I think they enjoyed themselves this year, contrary to what was brought up. Uh, we have a very, it's unique, a very low number of appeals, whether to the city or to any of the township boards or to any of the city boards. Good thing, bad thing, we never expect. We never really know what to do. So we follow suit with this. We expect a very slow board for the county. Very few owner-occupied appeals at night. As current as of today, we only have three. We don't know what we did right or did wrong. We're gonna find three? out. Three? Three. Yes. Total? Total. So speaks well of our equalization director. <laughs> Like I said, I wished I knew what we did. I'd like to copycat it. Yeah. Um, Can we just deny them today? <laughs> <laughs> there are only two, as we speak today, only two properties we are bringing forward to the board on the exempts, which will be the ninth after your normal board is done. So it, I hate to say it's going to be a light board, but it looks like. Which That's is like better than board. calling us a slow board or a heavy <laughs> board. Oh, boy, I walked into that one with both eyes open. <laughs> That is unbelievable. It, we don't know what we did right or didn't do, but we're going to do the same thing next year. That's awesome. Yeah. So I think that was really all. You'll get a more detailed uh, briefing memo of the numbers and what it entails. Uh, they have until Friday at 5 o'clock to appeal, so right. we'll get that done now to you. Real How quick. many did we have last year for comparative purposes? Last year in totality in the county, there were 1,400 appeals. There were quite a few of those that we didn't appeal to the county. Right. This year, as of this morning, we only have 205. Wow. It's amazing. It yes, it is, and that I like I said, I wish we knew what we did so we could repeat it. We'll give you credit for that right now. Thank you. I, yeah, I, uh, That's, uh, I'm not going to turn it down, but uh, don't ask me to repeat it because we don't know what we did. <laughs> Just, uh, we've gotten things equalized, and I think more public information has gone out as to what, where, when, and why. Well, thank you. for yes. Even thank if you can't define it, we're glad that that's the result. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's a good staff down there. I just take credit for it. So. <laughs> that's Thanks. good, too. Thank you. Thank you. Any other new business? Any old business? If not, we need to adjourn into executive session for a legal briefing and pending litigation. Correct That's to my do move. so. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn into a legal briefing and pending litigation. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion unanimously passes. Peter, can I? How different is